pedophilic nature of circumcision. Circumcision, known as Brit Mila in Hebrew, is a fundamental ritual in Judaism traditionally performed on male infants eight days after birth. This ritual symbolizes the covenant between God and the Jewish people, as established with the biblical patriarch Abraham. During a traditional Jewish circumcision ceremony, Brit Mila, the procedure is typically performed by a trained individual called a mohel. Preparation The baby is usually swaddled or securely held during the procedure. The mohel prepares the surgical instruments and sterilizes the area where the circumcision will take place. Circumcision The mohel removes the foreskin of the baby's penis using a surgical instrument called a mogian. The foreskin is separated from the glands, the tip of the penis, and then circumcised. Extraction of blood, metzitsa after the circumcision, the mohel performs metzitsa, which involves a quick extraction of a small amount of blood from the circumcision wound. Traditionally, this is done orally by the mohel, to suction the area and draw out a drop of blood. The mohel then performs a prayer called Blessing of the Circumcision, Berkat Hamila. When referring to the traditional practice of metzitsa during a circumcision ceremony, Orally means that the mohel uses his mouth to perform the extraction of blood from the circumcision wound i.e. the baby's penis. Specifically, the mohel would suction the area of the wound, which is the site where the foreskin has been removed from the penis. The foreskin, a retractable fold of skin covering the glands, the tip of the penis, is circumcised during the procedure. Once the foreskin is removed, the mohel would use his mouth to draw out a small amount of blood from the circumcision wound. It's important to note that this traditional method of metzitsa is based on religious customs and beliefs within certain Jewish communities. However, it has been a topic of debate and controversy due to potential health risks, including the transmission of infections. However, there was never any controversy over its pedophilic nature. As a result, some contemporary Jewish communities have modified or discontinued this practice opting for alternative methods such as using a sterile gauze or a sterile pipette to perform metzitsa. In summary, when describing the traditional practice of metzitsa being done orally by the mohel, it means that the mohel uses his mouth to suction the circumcision wound, which is the site where the foreskin has been removed from the penis of the baby, and extract a small amount of blood as part of the circumcision ritual. Pedophilic Nature of Ancient Jewish Law in ancient times, cultural and legal practices regarding marriage were different from contemporary standards. The Talmud contains discussions and rulings on various aspects of Jewish law, including marriage and family matters, which reflect the norms and customs of the time. Here's a brief summary of the topics discussed in each of the Talmudic passages Yebamot 57b, 58a, 60, Sanhedrin 54a, 54b, 55a, 55b, 69a and 69b. Paying specific attention to discussions about intercourse with minors. Yebamot 57b. This passage discusses various aspects of betrothal and marriage, including the legal age at which a girl can be betrothed. It states that a girl who is three years of age and one day may be betrothed by cohabitation. In the context of marriage, living with a priest would generally include sexual intercourse as marriage typically entails physical intimacy between the spouses. Therefore, when the rabbi declared the proselyte's daughter eligible to live with a priest, it would imply that she was considered eligible to marry a priest, engage in sexual relations within the context of marriage, and live together as husband and wife. Yebamot 58a This passage continues the discussion on betrothal and marriage, focusing on the legal requirements and implications of betrothal ceremonies and agreements. Yebamot 60. In this passage, the legitimacy of the inhabitants of a certain town in Israel is disputed. The passage mentions the case of a proselyte's daughter who was under the age of three years and one day, and Rabbi Romanos declares her eligible to live with a priest. Sanhedrin 54a. This passage discusses various legal matters, including the death penalty and capital offenses. It does not specifically address intercourse with minors. Sanhedrin 54b. Similarly, this passage continues discussions on legal matters and capital offenses, but does not focus on intercourse with minors. Sanhedrin 55a. This passage discusses the legal concept of acquisition through marriage, 
specifically mentioning that a maiden aged three years and a day may be acquired in marriage by coition. Sanhedrin 55b, continuing from the previous passage, this one elaborates on the legal implications of betrothal and marriage, including cases involving young girls. It states that if a deceased husband's brother cohabits with her, she becomes his wife. Sanhedrin 69a, this passage discusses various legal matters, including cases of adultery and sexual offenses. It does not specifically address intercourse with minors. Sanhedrin 69b, similarly, this passage continues discussions on legal matters, focusing on cases of adultery and sexual offenses, but does not specifically discuss intercourse with minors. Overall, while some passages, such as Yebamot 57b and Sanhedrin 55b, mention legal rulings regarding intercourse with minors, others primarily focus on broader legal matters without specific discussions on this topic. It's important to consider the context of each passage and the broader themes within Jewish legal literature when examining discussions about sexual ethics and morality in the Talmud. These passages are part of legal discussions within the Talmud and should be understood within their historical and cultural context. It's important to note that Jewish law and practice have evolved over time, and contemporary interpretations prioritize ethical considerations and the well-being of individuals, especially minors. Although just as important to note, some Jewish communities still adhere closely to ancient traditions and teachings, maintaining practices that have been passed down through generations. These communities often prioritize the preservation of traditional customs and rituals, viewing them as integral to their identity and religious observance. They shun contemporary interpretations of Jewish law and tradition, preferring to adhere strictly to the teachings of the Torah and the Talmud as interpreted by earlier authorities. For these individuals, the continuity of ancient traditions provides a sense of connection to their ancestors and a foundation for their faith and communal life. They may resist or reject changes that they perceive as departing from the authentic teachings of Judaism, preferring to maintain the practices of their forebears. In their commitment to preserving ancient traditions, these Jewish communities find meaning, purpose, and a sense of belonging in a rich tapestry of religious and cultural heritage. In modern times, Jewish legal authorities emphasize the importance of consent, maturity, and ethical treatment in matters of marriage and family law. The passages from the Talmud should be interpreted as reflecting historical legal discussions and practices that may not align with contemporary standards. The Talmud In Yebamot 57b, the passage discusses the legal concept of betrothal and sets a specific age at which a girl can be betrothed. Betrothed refers to a formal agreement between two people to marry each other. It states that a girl who is three years of age and one day may be betrothed by cohabitation. This means that according to Jewish law as interpreted in this passage, a girl who has reached this age may be legally considered betrothed if she engages in cohabitation with a man, even without a formal marriage ceremony. In Sanhedrin 69a and 69b, the passages further discuss the legal aspects of betrothal and marriage, particularly in cases involving young girls. These passages also mention that a maiden aged three years and a day may be acquired in marriage by coition indicating a similar legal ruling to the one in Yebamot 57b. Additionally, they state that if a deceased husband's brother cohabits with her, she becomes his wife, illustrating the legal implications of these marriage practices within Jewish law. Overall, these passages provide insights into ancient Jewish legal traditions and practices related to marriage and betrothal, as discussed in the Talmud. They reflect the cultural and legal norms of the time and offer perspectives on how these matters were interpreted and regulated within Jewish communities. About this text. Yevamot. Talmud. Yevamot, the plural of the word used to refer to one's childless brother's widow, is the first tractate in Seder Nazim, Order of Women, which addresses family law. Its sixteen chapters discuss Yibam. The Torah mandated marriage of a widow to the brother of her childless husband as well as Halitza, the alternative right discharging that obligation, in which the widow takes off the shoe of her husband's brother and spits on the floor. Included in the tractate are also sections on the laws of marriage, prohibited sexual relations, and conversion. Composed, Talmudic Babylon, C.450, C.550C. Current Version, 
William Davidson Edition, Vocalized Aramaic Aramaic from the William Davidson Digital Edition of the Koran No Talmud With Commentary by Rabbi Aidan Even Israel English from the William Davidson Digital Edition of the Koran No Talmud With Commentary by Rabbi Aidan Even Israel Yebamot 57b There is significance to a priest entering a wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest. If a priest's daughter who is unfit to marry a priest enters the wedding canopy with a priest, she becomes disqualified from partaking of truma from her father's household. This is the case even if the priest did not betroth her, and they did not engage in sexual intercourse. And Shmuel said, There is no significance to a priest entering the wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest. Only sexual intercourse disqualifies her from the privileges of priesthood. Shmuel said, and Abba, i.e., Rav, whose first name was Abba, concedes to me, with regard to a girl less than three years and one day old, that she is not disqualified by merely entering the wedding canopy. Since there is no legal significance to an act of intercourse with her, there is no legal significance to entering the wedding canopy with her. Rava said we, too, learn in the following Baraita that there is no legal significance to an act of intercourse with a girl less than three years old. A girl three years and one day old can be betrothed via sexual intercourse. And if she was a Yavama and her Yavam had intercourse with her, he has acquired her. And a man who has intercourse with her while she is married to someone else is liable on her account because of the prohibition of intercourse with a married woman. And if she experiences a menstrual discharge, she renders richly impure a man who has intercourse with her, so that he renders impure the object upon which he lies like the upper one. If she is married to a priest she may partake of truma. If one of those who render women unfit for marrying a priest had intercourse with her, he has disqualified her from being able to partake of truma. Rava infers from this Baraita that it is a girl three years and one day old who is disqualified via intercourse, and consequently she is also disqualified via the wedding canopy. However, a girl who is less than three years and one day old, who is not disqualified via intercourse, is also not disqualified via the wedding canopy. The Gemara concludes, Indeed, learn from this that it is so. Rami Bar Amma said, With regard to the question of whether there is legal significance to a priest entering the wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest, we have arrived at the dispute cited in the Mishnah between Rabbi Meir on the one hand and Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon on the other. According to Rabbi Meir, who says that betrothal to a priest disqualifies a woman who is unfit to marry him from partaking of truma even if she is the daughter of a priest. Entering the wedding canopy with a priest also disqualifies her. Conversely, according to Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon, who say that betrothal does not disqualify her, entering the wedding canopy also does not disqualify her. The Gemara refutes this claim. And from where do we know that these Tanaim would apply their opinions with regard to betrothal to entering the wedding canopy? Perhaps Rabbi Meir only stated his opinion there, with regard to betrothal, which acquires her. However, in the case of a wedding canopy, which does not acquire her, no, she is not disqualified. Alternatively, perhaps Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon stated their opinion only there, with regard to betrothal, as it is not close to an act of sexual intercourse. However, with regard to entering the wedding canopy, which is close to an act of sexual intercourse, as it is the place where the bride and groom are secluded together and symbolizes the woman's entrance into her husband's home, it is possible that it also disqualifies her from partaking of truma. Rather, if it can be said that this issue was already discussed by earlier sages, it was in the dispute between these other tanaim, as it is taught in a baraita, if they married one another, i.e. either a woman who is fit or a woman who is unfit married a priest, or they entered the wedding canopy and did not yet have intercourse with him, they are entitled to eat of his food and to partake of truma. The Gemara interrupts its presentation of the Baraita to examine its wording. The fact that the Baraita mentions a case where they entered the wedding canopy but did not yet have intercourse proves by inference that the earlier case, where they married, is referring to actual marriage. However, this is difficult because if they were actually married and had engaged in intercourse, the woman who was unfit to marry a priest is certainly disqualified from partaking of truma due to the prohibited act of intercourse. Rather, is it not that the Baraita is referring to a single case, where they were married, 
and they entered the canopy, and had not had intercourse? And it is taught in the Baraita that they are entitled to partake of his food and to partake of truma. This indicates that entrance into the wedding canopy does not disqualify a woman who is unfit to marry a priest from eating truma, although the act of intercourse does. The Baraita continues, Conversely, Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yonin ben Baroka, says, Any woman whose act of intercourse entitles her to partake of truma, her wedding canopy also entitles her to partake of truma, and any woman whose act of intercourse does not entitle her to partake of truma, her wedding canopy also does not entitle her to partake of truma. Consequently, it appears that the Tanaim cited in this Baraita disagree over the very question of whether the entry of a priest and a woman unfit to marry him into the wedding canopy has legal significance. The Gemara refutes this claim, from where do we know that this is correct? Perhaps Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yonin ben Baroka, holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir who said that in the case of the betrothal of a woman unfit for a priest she may not partake of truma? The Gemara expresses surprise. According to this suggestion, this expression in the Baraita is difficult. Any woman whose act of intercourse does not entitle her to partake of truma, her wedding canopy also does not entitle her to partake of truma. It should have said, any woman whose act of intercourse does not entitle her to partake of truma, her betrothal money also does not entitle her to partake of truma, as it was the betrothal that disqualified her. The Gemara counters this argument. Perhaps it can be suggested that since the first Tana said his ruling with regard to a wedding canopy, Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yonin ben Baroka, also said his ruling with regard to a wedding canopy, even though he holds that she was already disqualified from the time of her betrothal. Ravimram said this matter was said to us by Rav Sheshit and he illuminated our eyes from the Mishnah, i.e., he demonstrated that the Mishnah serves as the basis for his opinion. Rav Sheshit's statement was as follows. There is significance to a priest entering the wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest. And the Tana of the Mishnah also taught this halakha with regard to a soda, soda 18a. B. When a soda is brought to the temple to drink the bitter waters, she affirms the oath imposed on her by a priest that she has not committed adultery. The Mishnah explains that when she says Amen, it is as though she herself states that, I did not go astray while betrothed, or married, or as a widow waiting for her Yavim, or as a fully married woman. The Gemara inquires, This case of a betrothed woman, what are the circumstances? If we say that he was jealous of her and warned her not to seclude herself with a particular man when she was betrothed, and he also causes her to drink the waters when she is betrothed, is a betrothed woman fit to drink the waters of a soda? Didn't we learn in a Mishnah, Soda 23 be a betrothed woman and a widow waiting for her Yavim do not drink, as the halakha of the soda waters applies only to married women, and they do not collect their marriage contract if they secluded themselves after being warned, as they have acted in a licentious fashion? Rather, the case in the first Mishnah cited above is that he was jealous of her, and warned her not to seclude herself with a particular man when she was betrothed, and she secluded herself with that man, and her husband causes her to drink when she is already married. However, in that case do the waters examine her? Isn't it taught in a Baraita with regard to the verse, And the man shall be clear from iniquity, and that woman shall bear her iniquity, Numbers 531, that when the man is clear of iniquity the waters examine his wife. But if the man is not clear of iniquity the waters do not examine his wife? By secluding herself with the other man when she was betrothed, the woman rendered herself forbidden to her husband. If he then married her, he cannot be described as clear of iniquity, and therefore the soda waters are ineffective. Rather, it must be that he was jealous of her when she was betrothed, and she secluded herself with the other man anyway and she had entered the wedding canopy but did not yet have intercourse with her husband when he brought her to the priest. Consequently, she is made to drink the soda waters as a married woman, and her husband has not committed a transgression, as he has not had intercourse with her. Learn from this that there is significance to a priest entering the wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest, as demonstrated by the fact that the soda waters will examine her in these circumstances. Rava said, Do you hold that this Baraita is sufficiently accurate to rely upon? But when Rabbi A. Baranina came from the south, he came with this Baraita in hand. The verse states with regard to the oath of the soda, 
and some man has lain with you besides your husband, Numbers 5.20, which indicates that it applies only when the cohabitation of the husband preceded that of the adulterer, but not when the cohabitation of the adulterer preceded that of the husband. Consequently, in the case under discussion, drinking the soda waters would not be effective. Rami Barama said, You find it in a case such as where her betrothed had intercourse with her licentiously when she was a betrothed woman in her father's house. Since the act of intercourse was committed licentiously rather than for the purpose of consummating the marriage, the woman is still considered betrothed. Subsequently, her betrothed warned her not to seclude herself with a particular man, and she disobeyed. Then, they entered the wedding canopy together, despite the fact that they are forbidden to one another. Once they entered the wedding canopy, the woman can be made to drink the bitter waters. This proves that there is significance to entering the wedding canopy with a woman that is unfit for one to marry. The Gemara asks, If so, in the corresponding case with regard to a widow waiting for her Yavim, in which the Yavim had licentious intercourse with her in her father-in-law's house, do you call her a widow waiting for her Yavim? Once they have engaged in intercourse, she is his proper wife, as Rav said that one who has intercourse with his Yavama, even without intending to thereby perform Levirate marriage, has acquired her for all matters. The Gemara responds, This is in accordance with the opinion of Shmuel, who said that he has acquired her only with regard to the matters stated in the chapter of Levirate marriage, but not with regard to other matters, and therefore she is not considered his wife with regard to the Halakot of Soda. Yebamot 58a. According to Rabbi Meir, who says that betrothal to a priest disqualifies a woman who is unfit to marry him from partaking of truma even if she is the daughter of a priest, entering the wedding canopy with a priest also disqualifies her. Conversely, according to Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon, who say that betrothal does not disqualify her, entering the wedding canopy also does not disqualify her. The Gemara refutes this claim. And from where do we know that these ten I'm would apply their opinions with regard to betrothal to entering the wedding canopy? Perhaps Rabbi Meir only stated his opinion there, with regard to betrothal, which acquires her. However, in the case of a wedding canopy, which does not acquire her, no, she is not disqualified. Alternatively, perhaps Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon stated their opinion only there, with regard to betrothal, as it is not close to an act of sexual intercourse. However, with regard to entering the wedding canopy, which is close to an act of sexual intercourse, as it is the place where the bride and groom are secluded together and symbolizes the woman's entrance into her husband's home, it is possible that it also disqualifies her from partaking of truma. Rather, if it can be said that this issue was already discussed by earlier sages, it was in the dispute between these other ten I'm, as it is taught in a Baraita. If they married one another, i.e., either a woman who is fit or a woman who is unfit married a priest, or they entered the wedding canopy and did not yet have intercourse with him, they are entitled to eat of his food and to partake of truma. The Gemara interrupts its presentation of the Baraita to examine its wording. The fact that the Baraita mentions a case where they entered the wedding canopy but did not yet have intercourse proves by inference that the earlier case, where they married, is referring to actual marriage. However, this is difficult because if they were actually married and had engaged in intercourse, the woman who was unfit to marry a priest is certainly disqualified from partaking of truma due to the prohibited act of intercourse. Rather, is it not that the Baraita is referring to a single case, where they were married, and they entered the canopy, and had not had intercourse? And it is taught in the Baraita that they are entitled to partake of his food and to partake of truma. This indicates that entrance into the wedding canopy does not disqualify a woman who is unfit to marry a priest from eating truma, although the act of intercourse does. The Baraita continues, Conversely, Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yonan ben Baroka, says, Any woman whose act of intercourse entitles her to partake of truma, her wedding canopy also entitles her to partake of truma, and any woman whose act of intercourse does not entitle her to partake of truma. Her wedding canopy also does not entitle her to partake of truma. Consequently, it appears that the Tanaim cited in this berated disagree over the very question of whether the entry of a priest and a woman unfit to marry him into the wedding canopy has legal significance. The Gemara refutes this claim, from where do we know that this is correct? Perhaps Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yonan ben Baroka, 
holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir, who said that in the case of the betrothal of a woman unfit for a priest she may not partake of truma? The Gemara expresses surprise. According to this suggestion, this expression in the Baraita is difficult. Any woman whose act of intercourse does not entitle her to partake of truma, her wedding canopy also does not entitle her to partake of truma. It should have said, any woman whose act of intercourse does not entitle her to partake of truma, her betrothal money also does not entitle her to partake of truma, as it was the betrothal that disqualified her. The Gemara counters this argument. Perhaps it can be suggested that since the first Tana said his ruling with regard to a wedding canopy, Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Yonin ben Baroka, also said his ruling with regard to a wedding canopy, even though he holds that she was already disqualified from the time of her betrothal. Ravimram said this matter was said to us by Rav Sheshit, and he illuminated our eyes from the Mishnah, i.e., he demonstrated that the Mishnah serves as the basis for his opinion. Rav Sheshit's statement was as follows. There is significance to a priest entering the wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest. And the Tana of the Mishnah also taught this halakha with regard to a soda, soda 18a. B. When a soda is brought to the temple to drink the bitter waters, she affirms the oath imposed on her by a priest that she has not committed adultery. The Mishnah explains that when she says Amen, it is as though she herself states that, I did not go astray while betrothed, or married, or as a widow waiting for her Yavim, or as a fully married woman. The Gemara inquires, This case of a betrothed woman, what are the circumstances? If we say that he was jealous of her and warned her not to seclude herself with a particular man when she was betrothed, and he also causes her to drink the waters when she is betrothed, is a betrothed woman fit to drink the waters of a soda? Didn't we learn in a Mishnah, Soda 23 be a betrothed woman and a widow waiting for her Yavim do not drink, as the halakha of the soda waters applies only to married women, and they do not collect their marriage contract if they secluded themselves after being warned, as they have acted in a licentious fashion? Rather, the case in the first Mishnah cited above is that he was jealous of her, and warned her not to seclude herself with a particular man when she was betrothed, and she secluded herself with that man, and her husband causes her to drink when she is already married. However, in that case do the waters examine her? Isn't it taught in a Baraita with regard to the verse? And the man shall be clear from iniquity, and that woman shall bear her iniquity. Numbers 531 That when the man is clear of iniquity the waters examine his wife. But if the man is not clear of iniquity the waters do not examine his wife? By secluding herself with the other man when she was betrothed, the woman rendered herself forbidden to her husband. If he then married her, he cannot be described as clear of iniquity, and therefore the soda waters are ineffective. Rather, it must be that he was jealous of her when she was betrothed, and she secluded herself with the other man anyway and she had entered the wedding canopy but did not yet have intercourse with her husband when he brought her to the priest. Consequently, she is made to drink the soda waters as a married woman, and her husband has not committed a transgression, as he has not had intercourse with her. Learn from this that there is significance to a priest entering the wedding canopy with women who are unfit to marry a priest, as demonstrated by the fact that the soda waters will examine her in these circumstances. Rava said, Do you hold that this Baraita is sufficiently accurate to rely upon? But when Rabbi A. Baranina came from the south, he came with this Baraita in hand. The verse states with regard to the oath of the soda. And some man has lain with you besides your husband. Numbers 520, which indicates that it applies only when the cohabitation of the husband preceded that of the adulterer, but not when the cohabitation of the adulterer preceded that of the husband. Consequently, in the case under discussion, drinking the soda waters would not be effective. Rami Barama said, You find it in a case such as where her betrothed had intercourse with her licentiously when she was a betrothed woman in her father's house. Since the act of intercourse was committed licentiously rather than for the purpose of consummating the marriage, the woman is still considered betrothed. Subsequently, her betrothed warned her not to seclude herself with a particular man, and she disobeyed. Then, they entered the wedding canopy together, despite the fact that they are forbidden to one another. Once they entered the wedding canopy, the woman can be made to drink the bitter waters. This proves that there is significance to entering the wedding canopy with a woman that is unfit for one to marry. The Gemara asks, 
if so, in the corresponding case with regard to a widow waiting for her Yavam, in which the Yavam had licentious intercourse with her in her father-in-law's house, do you call her a widow waiting for her Yavam? Once they have engaged in intercourse, she is his proper wife, as Rav said that one who has intercourse with his Yavama, even without intending to thereby perform levirate marriage, has acquired her for all matters. The Gemara responds, This is in accordance with the opinion of Shmuel, who said that he has acquired her only with regard to the matters stated in the chapter of levirate marriage, but not with regard to other matters, and therefore she is not considered his wife with regard to the halakot of Soda. Yebamot 60b. Didn't Rabbi Shimon say, if she was fit for a high priest, her brother must become impure for her, and if she was not fit for a high priest, her brother may not become impure for her? A divorced woman is not fit for a high priest even if she had been only betrothed before her divorce. The Gemara answers, it is different there, as the merciful one includes her by the term, who is near, which includes any sister who is close to him even if she is unfit for a high priest. The Gemara asks, If so, a woman whose hymen was torn accidentally should also be included. The Gemara responds that the term, Who is near, which is written in the singular, includes only one additional case and not two. The Gemara asks, And what did you see to render forbidden a woman whose hymen was accidentally torn and permit a divorcee who had previously been only betrothed, and not the opposite? The Gemara answers, in this case of the woman whose hymen was torn, an action has been performed on her body, whereas in that case of the divorcee, no action has been performed on her body. The Baraita cites Rabbi Yosei and Rabbi Shimon as holding that a priest may not become impure for his sister who was betrothed and then divorced, and it cites only Rabbi Shimon as holding that he may not become impure for his sister who was a grown woman. Based on this, the Gemara asks, from the fact that Rabbi Yosei left his partner, Rabbi Shimon, it may be inferred that with regard to a woman whose hymen was torn accidentally he holds in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Meir, that a priest does become impure. From where does he derive this halakha? The Gemara explains that he derives it from the phrase, Who has had no man? As a woman whose hymen was torn accidentally has not been with a man. The Gemara asks, Haven't you already derived the halakha of a betrothed woman from that phrase? The Gemara answers, Rabbi Yosei learns one halakha from the phrase, has had no, which indicates that she has not even been betrothed, and he derives one halakha from the term, man, which indicates that only a woman who was with a man is no longer considered a virgin with regard to this halakha, but not one whose hymen was torn accidentally. It was stated previously that according to Rabbi Shimon, the term, to him, comes to include a grown woman. The Gemara asks, didn't Rabbi Shimon say with regard to a high priest that the term virgin indicates a complete virgin, which does not include a grown woman? The Gemara answers, His reason there is also derived from here, as he expounds as follows, from the fact that the expression, to him, is needed to include a grown woman, it may be inferred that the term virgin by itself indicates a complete virgin. The Gemara cites another ruling of Rabbi Shimon ben Yoai also related to the discussion of defining who is considered a virgin. It is taught in a Baraita that Rabbi Shimon ben Yoai says, A female convert who converted when she was less than three years and one day old is permitted to marry into the priesthood, as it is stated. But all the women children that have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Numbers 31 colon 18 This verse indicates that these women were fit for all of the warriors and since Pine has the priest was with them, see Numbers 31 colon 6, it is clear that young converts are permitted to priests. The Gemara asks, and how do the rabbis, who disagree with Rabbi Shimon, interpret this verse? The Gemara responds, they understand the phrase, keep alive for yourselves, to mean that they could keep them as slaves and as maid servants, but they could not necessarily marry them. The Gemara asks, if so, if the source for Rabbi Shimon's ruling is this verse, a girl who converted at the age of three years and one day old should also be permitted to a priest, as long as she has never had intercourse, as stated by the verse. The Gemara replies, his reasoning is as stated by Rav Huna. As Rav Huna raised a contradiction, it is written in one verse, Kill every woman that has known man by lying with him. Numbers 31 colon 17 
which indicates that a woman who has not known a man in this way you may keep alive. This proves by inference that the female children, who are not classified as women, you may keep alive regardless of whether they knew a man or they did not know a man. And it is written in a different verse, But all the women children that have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves, Numbers 31, 18, which indicates that if they have known men, you must kill them. This is an apparent contradiction. Rav Huna explains, you must say that the verse is speaking of a woman who is fit for intercourse. The verse does not mean to distinguish between women who have actually engaged in sexual intercourse and those who have not. Rather, it distinguishes between a girl over the age of three, with whom an act of intercourse is recognized as such, and a girl below the age of three. This is also taught in a Baraita, every woman that has known man. The verse is speaking of a woman who is fit for intercourse. The Baraita proceeds to discuss this halakha. Do you say it is referring to one who is fit for intercourse, or perhaps it is referring only to one who has actually had intercourse? When the verse states, But all the women children that have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves, which indicates that grown women must be killed even if they have not had intercourse with a man, you must say that the verse is speaking of a woman who is fit for intercourse. The Gemara asks a practical question with regard to the events described by the Torah. From where did they know whether a particular girl was already three years old and fit for intercourse? Rav Huna Bar Bizna said that Rabbi Shimon Asida said, they passed them before the front plate of the high priest. Any girl whose face miraculously turned sallow, it was known that she was fit for intercourse, and any girl whose face did not turn sallow, it was thereby known that she was not fit for intercourse. Similarly, Rav Nauman said, a sign of transgression in the area of sexual morality is the disease hydrokin, which causes one's face to turn sallow. Similarly, you can say with regard to the verse, and they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead four hundred young virgins that had not known man by lying with him. Judges 21 verse 12. From where did they know that they were virgins? Rav Kahana said, they sat them on the opening of a barrel of wine. If she was a non-virgin, her breath would smell like wine. If she was a virgin, her breath did not smell like wine. The Gemara suggests, they should have passed them before the front plate, as described previously with regard to the daughters of Midian. Rav Kahana, son of Rav Natan, said, the verse states with regard to the front plate, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord, Exodus 28 verse 38 which indicates that the front plate is worn for acceptance but not for calamity. The Gemara raises a difficulty. If so, the front plate should also not have been used with regard to the women of Midian. Rav Ashi said, the word they is written in the verse, indicating that for them, the Jewish people, the front plate is for acceptance but not for calamity. But for Gentiles it can be used even for calamity. Rabbi Yaakov bar Edi said that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said, the halakha is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Yoai. Rabbi Zaira said to Rabbi Yaakov bar Edi, Did you hear Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi say this explicitly or did you learn it by inference? The Gemara asks, What inference was Rabbi Zaira hinting at? The Gemara explains, As Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said, There was a certain city in Eretz Yisrael where they contested the lineage of a particular family. And Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi sent Rabbi Romanus, and he examined the family's lineage and found that it included the daughter of a convert who had converted when she was less than three years and one day old, and she had married a priest. And Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi permitted her to the priesthood. This indicates that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi ruled in accordance with Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Yaakov bar Edi said to him, I heard explicitly that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi ruled in this manner. The Gemara asks, and if Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi's opinion had been derived by inference, what of it? The Gemara answers, perhaps it was different there, because since she had already married a priest, she could remain married after the fact, but it would not be permitted for her to marry a priest of Initio, as it is Rav and Rabbi Yonin who both say, a high priest may not marry a grown woman and a woman whose hymen was torn accidentally but if he married one of them he is married and not required to divorce her. The Gemara refutes this claim. How can these cases be compared? Granted there, in the case of a grown woman, 
it is reasonable for her to be permitted after the fact, as a young woman will eventually be a grown woman under him, i.e., while married to him, and she will eventually be a non-virgin under him. However, here, in the case of a convert, will she eventually be a zona under him? If she is forbidden to a priest of initio it is because she has the status of a zona, in which case she should be prohibited after the fact as well. Consequently, it can be proven from the incident cited previously that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi rules in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. The Gemara comments, Rav Safra taught this halakha after deriving Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi's ruling by inference, although he had never heard this ruling explicitly. And the question mentioned above was difficult for him, and he resolved it in this same manner. The Gemara relates another incident related to this halakha. A certain priest married a convert who had converted when she was less than three years and one day old. Rav Naman Bar Yitzhak said to him, What is this? Why are you violating the halakha? He said to him, It is permitted for me to marry her, as Rabbi Yaakov Bar Edi said that Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said that the halakha is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Yoai. He said to him, Go remove her, i.e. divorce her. And if not, I will remove Rabbi Yaakov Bar Edi from your ear, Mianek, for you. In other words, I will take the necessary action to ensure that you obey and divorce her, so that you can no longer follow Rabbi Yaakov Bar Edi's opinion. Sanhedrin 54a. It is taught in a Baraita in accordance with the opinion of Rava, with regard to the verse, and the man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be put to death their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus 20 verse 11, the term, the man, excludes a minor. The phrase who lies with his father's wife, indicates that he is liable to receive capital punishment whether she is his father's wife who is his mother or whether she is his father's wife who is not his mother. From where is it derived that he is liable in a case where she is his mother who is not his father's wife? The verse states, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Although this phrase does not relate directly to the case of one's mother who is not his father's wife, the halakha in this case is derived from this phrase as it is free, i.e., the phrase is superfluous in this context, and is evidently included in the verse in order to compare between the two cases and learn a verbal analogy from it, as the Baraita will elaborate below. From the phrase, both of them shall be put to death. It is derived that they are executed by stoning. The Baraita asks, do you say that that they are executed by stoning, or is it rather by one of all the other types of the death penalty that are stated in the Torah? The Baraita answers, It is stated here, their blood shall be upon them, and it is stated with regard to a necromancer and a sorcerer, their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus 20 verse 27 Just as though the verse states that a necromancer and a sorcerer are executed by stoning, so too here with regard to one who engages in intercourse with his father's wife, the transgressors are executed by stoning. The Baraita asks, We have learned the punishment for one who engages in intercourse with his father's wife. From where is the prohibition against doing this act derived? The Baraita answers, The verse states, The nakedness of your father and the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. Leviticus 18 verse 7 The phrase, the nakedness of your father is referring to your father's wife. The Baraita asks, Do you say that the reference is to your father's wife, or is it rather referring to the nakedness of your father literally, i.e., to homosexual intercourse with one's father? The Baraita answers, It is stated here, The nakedness of your father you shall not uncover, and it is stated there, in the verse that describes the punishment, and the man who lies with his father's wife he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Leviticus 20 verse 11. Just as there, the verse is speaking of marriage, i.e., it is not referring to the father himself but to his wife, so too here, the verse is speaking of marriage, i.e., his father's wife. And the verse indicates that one's father's wife is forbidden to him whether she is his father's wife who is his mother or whether she is his father's wife who is not his mother. From where is it derived that she is forbidden to him in a case where she is his mother who is not his father's wife? The verse states, The nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. Leviticus 18 verse 7. The Baraita asks, I have derived only with regard to the prohibition that the verse renders the halakha of his mother who is not his father's wife like that of his mother who is his father's wife. But with regard to the punishment, 
from where do I derive that they share the same halakha? The Baraita answers, expounding on the verbal analogy it mentioned earlier, it is stated here, in the verse that describes the prohibition, the nakedness of your father, you shall not uncover, Leviticus 18 verse 7, and it is stated there, in the verse that describes the punishment, he has uncovered his father's nakedness, Leviticus 20 verse 11. It is derived from this verbal analogy that just as with regard to the prohibition, the verse renders his mother who is not his father's wife like his mother who is his father's wife, i.e., both are forbidden, so too, with regard to the punishment, the verse renders his mother who is not his father's wife like his mother who is his father's wife. It is derived from the phrase, She is your mother, Leviticus 18 verse 7, that you render him liable due to the prohibition against engaging in intercourse with his mother but you do not render him liable due to the prohibition against engaging in intercourse with his father's wife. The Baraita ends here. Since the Halakot in the collection of Baratah where this Baraita appears, Torah Kohanim, are in accordance with the opinions of Rabbi Yehuda, the Baraita supports the opinion of Rava, who explains the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda in this manner. The Gemara discusses the Baraita, asking, And how do the Rabbis, who disagree with Rabbi Yehuda, interpret the phrase, the nakedness of your father? The Gemara answers, they hold that this phrase is meant literally, i.e., that it is referring to homosexual intercourse. They do not accept the verbal analogy from which Rabbi Yehuda derives that the reference is to intercourse with one's father's wife. The Gemara asks, isn't this prohibition against homosexual intercourse with one's father derived from the verse, and you shall not lie with a male as with a woman? It is an abomination, Leviticus 18 verse 22? The Gemara answers, The prohibition is stated specifically with regard to one's father in order to render him liable to bring two sin offerings for unwittingly engaging in intercourse with his father, and it is in accordance with the statement of Rav Yehuda. As Rav Yehuda says, A Gentile who engages in intercourse with his father is liable for committing two transgressions. Likewise, one who engages in intercourse with his father's brother is liable for committing two transgressions. Rav says, it stands to reason that the statement of Rav Yehuda is with regard to a Jew who does this unwittingly. And the statement that he is liable for committing two transgressions concerns his liability to bring an offering, i.e., he is liable to bring two sin offerings. And even though the fact remains that he said Gentile, it is a euphemism, as he did not want to attribute such a sin to a Jew. As if it enters your mind that the reference is literally to a Gentile, the statement that he is liable for committing two transgressions is meaningless. What is his punishment for such a transgression? It is death. Could you kill him twice? Rather, it must be referring to a Jew who acted unwittingly. This halakha is also taught in a Baraita. One who engages in intercourse with his father is liable for committing two transgressions. One who engages in intercourse with his father's brother is liable for committing two transgressions, as it is stated. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother, Leviticus 18 verse 14. Some say that this is not in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, as in his opinion there is no special prohibition against homosexual intercourse with one's father. He interprets the verse, The nakedness of your father, you shall not uncover, as referring to one's father's wife. Accordingly, one who engages in homosexual intercourse with his father or with his father's brother is liable only due to the general prohibition against homosexual intercourse. And some say, you may even say that the Baraita is in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, and that he derives that there is a specific prohibition against homosexual intercourse with one's father by an a fortiori inference from the prohibition concerning one's father's brother. And the inference is as follows. If for intercourse with one's father's brother, who is merely his father's relative, one is liable for committing two transgressions, for intercourse with his father, is it not clear all the more so that he should be liable for committing two transgressions? And the sages who provide these two interpretations of Rabbi Yehuda's opinion disagree with regard to the issue that is the subject of the dispute between Abay and Rava. One sage, he of the second interpretation, holds that one administers punishment based on an a fortiori inference. Even with regard to a prohibition that is derived a fortiori, one who transgresses it is liable. And one sage, he of the first interpretation, holds that one does not administer punishment based on an a fortiori inference. 
the Gemara asks, and with regard to the rabbis, who disagree with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, from where do they derive the prohibition of intercourse with one's father's wife? The Gemara answers, they derive it from the verse, The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. Leviticus 18 verse 8. The Gemara asks, And what does Rabbi Yehuda derive from this verse, since he derives the prohibition from the verse, The nakedness of your father, you shall not uncover? The Gemara answers, That verse is necessary for the prohibition of one's father's wife after his father's death. Even though his father is dead, his father's wife remains forbidden to him. The Gemara asks, And from where do the rabbis derive that halakha? The Gemara answers, That halakha is derived from the last clause of the verse, It is your father's nakedness. The Gemara asks, And what does Rabbi Yehuda derive from that clause? The Gemara answers, That clause is necessary to teach the halakha that if one engages in intercourse with his father's wife, you render him liable due to the prohibition against engaging in intercourse with his father's wife. But you do not render him liable due to the prohibition against engaging in intercourse with a married woman. The Gemara asks, But didn't we learn in the Mishnah, one who engages in intercourse with his father's wife is liable to bring two offerings, one due to the fact that she is his father's wife and one due to the fact that she is a married woman, and he is liable due to the former prohibition both during his father's lifetime and after his father's death? The Gemara notes, and Rabbi Yehuda does not dispute this. So how can it be suggested that in Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, one who engages in intercourse with his father's wife is not liable for engaging in intercourse with a married woman? Abe says, he disputes this ruling in Abaraita. Although it is not mentioned in the Mishnah that Rabbi Yehuda disputes this ruling, it mentioned in a different source. The Gemara asks, and as for the rabbis, from where do they derive the punishment for one who engages in intercourse with his father's wife after his father's death? Granted, according to Rabbi Yehuda, it is derived by means of a verbal analogy. But from where do the rabbis, who do not accept the verbal analogy, derive it? The Gemara answers, The rabbis can say to you that it is derived as follows. With regard to that phrase, he has uncovered his father's nakedness from which Rabbi Yehuda derives a verbal analogy, they derive from it the punishment for one who engages in intercourse with his father's wife after his father's death. The Gemara asks, And as for the rabbis, from where do they derive the punishment for one who engages in intercourse with his mother who is not his father's wife? Rav Shisha, son of Rav Edi, says, The verse states, She is your mother, Leviticus 18 verse 7. The verse renders the halakha of his mother who is not his father's wife like that of his mother who is his father's wife. The Mishnah teaches with regard to one who engages in intercourse with his daughter-in-law that he is liable both due to the fact that she is his daughter-in-law and due to the fact that she is a married woman. The Gemara asks, And let him also be liable due to engaging in intercourse with his son's wife. As it is stated in the verse, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife, you shall not uncover her nakedness. Leviticus 18 verse 15. Abe says, The verse begins with his daughter-in-law and ends with his son's wife. To tell you that these are not two prohibitions. Rather, his daughter-in-law, Kalado, is his son's wife. They are one and the same. Mishnah, a man who engages in intercourse with a male or with an animal, and a woman who engages in intercourse with an animal, are executed by stoning. The animal is likewise stoned to death. The Mishnah asks, If the person sinned by doing this, how did the animal sin? Rather, because a calamity was caused to a person by it, therefore the verse states that it should be stoned, so that it does not cause another to sin. Alternatively, it is so that this animal will not pass through the marketplace, and those who see it will say, This is the animal because of which so and so was stoned, and its existence would shame his memory. Gemara, from where do we derive the prohibition and punishment for homosexual intercourse with a male? It is as the sages taught in a Baraita with regard to the verse, and if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus 20 verse 13 The word, man, excludes a minor boy. The phrase, lies with a male, is referring to any male whether he is an adult man or whether he is a minor boy. 
The phrase, as with a woman, mishkaveisha, referring to lying with a woman, appears in the plural. The verse teaches you that there are two manners of lying with a woman for which one who engages in intercourse with a woman forbidden to him is punished, vaginal and anal intercourse. Rabbi Yishmael says, This phrase is written to come to teach about the punishment for homosexual intercourse, and the halakha that one is liable for anal intercourse with a woman who is forbidden to him is found to be derived from it. The phrase, they shall be put to death, is referring to execution by stoning. Do you say that they are executed by stoning, or is it rather by one of all the other types of death penalty that are stated in the Torah? It is stated here, their blood shall be upon them, and it is stated with regard to a necromancer and a sorcerer, their blood shall be upon them, Leviticus 20 verse 27, just as though the verse states that a necromancer and a sorcerer are executed by stoning, so too here, they are executed by stoning, Sanhedrin 54b. We have learned the punishment for homosexual intercourse, but from where is the prohibition derived? The verse states, And you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 18 verse 22. We have learned from here the prohibition for the one who engages in homosexual intercourse actively. From where do we derive the prohibition for one who engages in homosexual intercourse passively? The verse states, There shall not be a sodomite, Kadesh among the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 23 verse 18. And another verse, cited to clarify the meaning of the term Kadesh, states, And there were also Sodomites, Kadesh, in the land, they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord drove out before the children of Israel, 1 Kings 14 verse 24. This is the statement of Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Akiva says, It is not necessary to derive this halakha from the verse there shall not be a sodomite. Rather, it says, and you shall not lie, Tishkav, with a male as with a woman. Read into the verse, you shall not enable your being lain with, Tishikef, by a male. The Gemara asks, from where do we derive that one who engages in intercourse with an animal is liable to receive capital punishment? It is as the sages taught, and if a man lies with an animal, he shall be put to death, and you shall kill the animal, Leviticus 20 verse 15. The word man excludes a minor boy. The phrase lies with an animal is referring to any animal, whether old or young. The phrase shall be put to death refers to execution by stoning. Do you say that they are executed by stoning, or is it rather by one of all the other types of death penalty that are stated in the Torah? It is stated here, you shall kill, and it is stated there, with regard to an insider, but you shall kill him and you shall stone him with stones and he shall die, Deuteronomy 13 verses 10 to 11. Just as though the verse states that an insider is executed by stoning, so too here, one who engages in bestiality is executed by stoning. We have learned the punishment for one who engages in bestiality actively. But from where do we derive the punishment for one who engages in bestiality passively? The verse states, Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death, Exodus 22 verse 18. If this verse is not needed for the matter of the one who actively lies with an animal, i.e., a male who sexually penetrates an animal, apply it to the matter of the one who causes an animal to lie with him, by being penetrated by the animal, i.e., any type of intercourse with an animal is punishable by death. We have therefore learned the punishment for both one who engages in bestiality actively, and one who engages in bestiality passively. But from where is the prohibition derived? The verse states, and you shall not lie with any animal to defile yourself with it. Leviticus 18 verse 23. We have learned the prohibition for one who engages in bestiality actively. From where do we derive the prohibition for one who engages in bestiality passively? The verse states, There shall not be a Kadesh among the children of Israel. And another verse states, And there were also Kadesh in the land which shows that anyone who engages in intercourse in a way that is like the abominations of the nations is called a Kadesh. This is the statement of Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Akiva says, It is not necessary to derive the halakha prohibiting passively engaging in bestiality from this verse. Rather, it says, You shall not lie, Shekhoveka, which can be read as follows, You shall not enable your being lame with, Shekhovatka. The Gemara discusses cases to which these halakhic expositions are relevant. What is the halakha of one who unwittingly engages in intercourse with a male, 
and unwittingly causes a male to engage in intercourse with him, within one lapse of awareness, i.e., without realizing in the interim that these behaviors are forbidden, is he considered to have transgressed two separate prohibitions and therefore liable to bring two sin offerings? Or is he considered to have transgressed one prohibition twice and liable to bring only one sin offering? Rabbi Abahu says, according to the statement of Rabbi Yishmael, he is liable for transgressing two different prohibitions. One is derived from the verse, You shall not lie. And the other one is derived from the verse, There shall not be a sodomite, which includes one who engages in homosexual intercourse passively. But according to the statement of Rabbi Akiva, he is liable for only one prohibition, as the prohibitions of, You shall not lie, Tishkav, and you shall not enable your being lain with, Tishikef, are one statement in the verse. Similarly, with regard to one who unwittingly engages in intercourse with an animal, and then unwittingly causes an animal to engage in intercourse with him within one lapse of awareness, Rabbi Abahu says, according to the statement of Rabbi Yishmael he is liable for transgressing two different prohibitions. One is derived from the verse, You shall not lie, and the other one is derived from the verse, There shall not be a sodomite. But according to the statement of Rabbi Akiva he is liable for only one prohibition, as the prohibitions of, You shall not lie, Shekhoveka, and you shall not enable your being lain with, Shekhovatka, are one statement in the verse. Abay says, Even according to the statement of Rabbi Yishmael he is liable for only one prohibition, as when it is written, There shall not be a sodomite, it is written only with regard to intercourse with men, but not with regard to bestiality. The Gemara asks, but according to Abay, from where does Rabbi Yishmael derive the prohibition for one who engages in bestiality passively? The Gemara answers, he derives it from the verse, Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. If this verse is not needed for the matter of the one who actively lies with the animal, apply it to the matter of the one who causes the animal to lie with him. And it is derived from the fact that the merciful one expresses the halakha of one who engages in bestiality passively using the term for one who engages in bestiality actively. Just as with regard to one who engages in bestiality actively the Torah both punishes for this action and prohibits it. So too, with regard to one who engages in bestiality passively, the Torah both punishes for this action and prohibits it. With regard to the case of one who was unwittingly sodomized by a male and then unwittingly was one with whom an animal copulated within one lapse of awareness, Rabbi Abahu says that according to the statement of Rabbi Akiva he is liable for transgressing two prohibitions. One is derived from the verse, You shall not lie with a male, and the other one is derived from the verse, You shall not lie with any animal. According to the statement of Rabbi Yishmael he is liable for transgressing only one prohibition as both this prohibition and that prohibition are derived from the verse, there shall not be a sodomite. Abay says, even according to the statement of Rabbi Yishmael he is liable for transgressing two prohibitions, as it is written, whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. If the verse is not needed for the matter of one who engages in bestiality actively, as this prohibition is stated explicitly in the verse, and you shall not lie with any animal, Leviticus 18 verse 23, apply it to the matter of one who engages in bestiality passively. And it is derived from the fact that the merciful one expresses the halakha of one who engages in bestiality passively using the term for one who engages in bestiality actively. Just as with regard to one who engages in bestiality actively the Torah both punishes for this act and prohibits it. So too, with regard to one who engages in bestiality passively, the Torah both punishes for this act and prohibits it. But with regard to one who unwittingly engages in intercourse with a male, and then unwittingly causes a male to engage in intercourse with him, and who unwittingly engages in intercourse with an animal, and then unwittingly causes an animal to engage in intercourse with him, performing all of these actions in one lapse of awareness, in this case, both according to Rabbi Abahu and according to Abay, the halakha according to the opinion of Rabbi Yishmael is that he is liable for transgressing three prohibitions the ones mentioned above and the prohibition of. There shall not be a sodomite, whereas according to the opinion of Rabbi. Akiva he is liable for transgressing only two prohibitions. The sages taught, with regard to intercourse with a male, the Torah does not deem a younger boy to be like an older boy, but with regard to intercourse with an animal, the Torah does deem a young animal to be like an old animal. 
The Gemara asks, What does it mean that the Torah does not deem a younger boy to be like an older boy? Rav says, It means that the Torah does not deem the intercourse of one who is less than nine years old to be like the intercourse of one who is at least nine years old. As for a male's act of intercourse to have the legal status of full-fledged intercourse the minimum age is nine years. And Shmuel says, The Torah does not deem the intercourse of a child who is less than three years old to be like that of one who is three years old. The Gemara asks, With regard to what principle do Rav and Shmuel disagree? The Gemara answers, Rav holds that any halakha that applies to one who engages in intercourse actively applies to one who engages in intercourse passively. And any halakha that does not apply to one who engages in intercourse actively does not apply to one who engages in intercourse passively. Therefore, just as one who engages in intercourse actively is not liable if he is less than nine years old, as the intercourse of such a child does not have the halakhic status of intercourse, so too, if a child who is less than nine years old engages in homosexual intercourse passively, the one who engages in intercourse with him is not liable. And Shmuel holds, It is written, And you shall not lie with a male as with a woman indicating that the halakha of a male who engages in intercourse passively is like that of a woman, just as the intercourse of a woman has the halakhic status of intercourse from when she is three years old, the same is true with regard to a male who engages in intercourse passively. Consequently, in Shmuel's opinion, one who engages in intercourse with a male who is older than three is liable. Sanhedrin 55a It is taught in a baraita in accordance with the opinion of Rav, one who engages in homosexual intercourse with a male aged nine years and one day, or one who engages in intercourse with an animal, whether in a typical manner or in an atypical manner, i.e., anal intercourse, and similarly a woman who engages in intercourse with an animal, whether in a typical manner or in an atypical manner, is liable. This baraita sets the minimum age for the passive male at nine years and one day. Ravnaman bar Rav is the taught. With regard to a woman there are two manners of lying. A woman who engages in intercourse with an animal, whether it is vaginal or anal intercourse, is liable. But with regard to a man who engages in intercourse with an animal there is only one manner of lying, i.e., vaginal intercourse. Rav Papa objects to this opinion. On the contrary, a woman, whose typical manner of intercourse is vaginal, is rendered liable for lying with an animal only in that manner she is not rendered liable for something else, i.e., for engaging in anal intercourse with an animal. With regard to a man who engages in intercourse with an animal, by contrast, since it is not its typical conduct to engage in intercourse with a man, he should be rendered liable for engaging in intercourse with it through each and every orifice. It is taught in a baraita in accordance with either of their opinions, one who engages in homosexual intercourse with a male aged nine years and one day, or one who engages in intercourse with an animal, whether in a typical manner, or in an atypical manner, i.e., anal intercourse, and similarly, a woman who engages in intercourse with an animal, whether in a typical manner or in an atypical manner, are liable. Evidently, there is no difference between the nature of the transgression of a woman who engages in bestiality, and a man who engages in bestiality in this regard. Ravena said to Rava, with regard to one who performs the initial stage of intercourse with another male, i.e., insertion of the penis, without completing the intercourse, what is the halakha? Is he liable for engaging in homosexual intercourse? The Gemara comments, with regard to one who performs the initial stage of intercourse with a male, what is the question? The expression, as with a woman, Leviticus 18 verse 22, is written with regard to him which indicates that any act that is considered an act of intercourse with a woman is also considered an act of intercourse with a man. Rather, the question is as follows. With regard to one who performs the initial stage of intercourse with an animal, what is the halakha? Rava said to him, in the verse, And you shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister nor of your father's sister, for he has made naked, hiara, his relative. Leviticus 20 verse 19 the word hiara alludes to the initial stage of intercourse, hiara. If the word hiara is not needed for the matter of the initial stage of intercourse in the context where it is written, i.e., for the prohibition of intercourse with one's father's sister and one's mother's sister, 
as it is not necessary in that context since the halakha of the initial stage of intercourse with regard to all forbidden sexual relations is compared by the Torah to the halakha of the initial stage of intercourse mentioned with regard to a menstruating woman. Apply it instead to the matter of the initial stage of intercourse with an animal. The superfluous expression that appears in the verse concerning one's and teaches that the initial stage of intercourse is considered intercourse even with regard to an animal. The Gemara asks, since one who engages in intercourse with an animal is among those who are liable to receive a court-imposed death penalty, why do I need the halakha of one who performs the initial stage of intercourse with an animal to be written in a verse concerning those who are liable to receive carrot, i.e., the case of one who engages in intercourse with his aunt? Let the Torah write this halakha with regard to those who are liable to receive a court-imposed death penalty and one would then derive this halakha concerning those who are liable to receive a court-imposed death penalty from the halakha of those who are liable to receive a court-imposed death penalty, and not from the less relevant halakha of one who engages in intercourse with his aunt, who is punished with carrot. The Gemara answers, Since the entire verse about the punishment of one who engages in intercourse with the sister of his father or mother is superfluous, and comes for the sake of exposition, as this halakha is already stated in other verses, see Leviticus 18 verses 12 to 13, this matter, i.e., the fact that the initial stage of intercourse is halakhically defined as intercourse, is also written in this verse for the purpose of an exposition, i.e., in order to indicate that this principle holds true. With regard to bestiality as well, Rav Adava Bar Ami asked Rav Sheshit, with regard to one who performs the initial stage of homosexual intercourse on himself, what is the halakha? Is he liable for homosexual intercourse? Rav Sheshit said to him, You disgust me with your question. Such an act is not possible. Rav Ashi said, What is your dilemma? With regard to doing so with an erect penis, you cannot find such a case. You can find it only when one performs this act of intercourse with a flaccid penis. And the halakha is subject to a dispute. According to the one who says that a man who engages in intercourse with a flaccid penis, with one of those with whom relations are forbidden, is exempt, as that is not considered intercourse, here too, when one does so to himself, he is exempt. And according to the one who says that he is liable, he is rendered liable here for transgressing two prohibitions according to Rabbi Yishmael. He is rendered liable for engaging in homosexual intercourse actively and he is rendered liable for engaging in homosexual intercourse passively. The students asked Rav Sheshit, with regard to a Gentile who engages in intercourse with an animal, what is the halakha? Must the animal be killed? The Gemara elaborates, Do we need two reasons to kill the animal, namely that it caused a calamity and that it caused shame, and therefore here the animal is not killed, as while there is a calamity, as it caused a person to sin and be executed? There is no shame, as the Jewish court is not responsible for the shame of a Gentile? Or perhaps one reason is enough, and an animal is killed because of the calamity it caused even if there is no shame? Rav Sheshit said, You learn the answer to this question in a Baraita, if with regard to trees, which neither eat nor drink nor smell, and nevertheless if they are used in idolatrous rites, the Torah says, Destroy, burn, and demolish them, see Deuteronomy, chapter 7, 12, and the reason is since a calamity was caused to people by them. Then with regard to one who leads another astray from the ways of life to the ways of death, all the more so he is liable to be destroyed. It can be derived from here that any item used for a transgression that renders one liable to be executed should be destroyed. The Gemara challenges this ruling. If that is so, in the case of a Gentile who bows down to his animal, the animal should be forbidden, i.e., it should be prohibited to derive benefit from it, and it should be killed. The Gemara answers, Is there anything that is not forbidden to a Jew, but is forbidden to a Gentile? Since a Jew who bows down to an animal does not render it forbidden, see Tamura 29b, a Gentile who does so does not render it forbidden either. The Gemara challenges that assumption. With regard to a Jew himself who bows down to his animal, let the animal be forbidden just as it is in a case of bestiality, when the animal is forbidden and is killed. Abe says, the cases are not the same. In this case, where one commits bestiality, his shame is great, but in that case, where one worships an animal, his shame is slight, 
and he will not be so disgraced if the animal is left alive. The Gemara asks, but with regard to trees that are used in idolatrous rites, in which case the shame of the idol worshippers is not great, the Torah nevertheless says, destroy, burn, and demolish them. The Gemara answers, we are speaking of living animals. The Halakha is different there, as the Merciful One has pity on them. Therefore, if the shame of the person is not great, the animal is not killed. Rava says that there is a different reason for the distinction between an animal that was worshipped and an animal with which one committed bestiality. The Torah states that because the animal enjoyed the transgression, it must be killed. This cannot be said about an animal that was worshipped. The Gemara asks, but with regard to trees that are used in idolatrous rites, which do not enjoy the transgression, nevertheless the Torah says, destroy, burn, and demolish. The Gemara answers, we are speaking of living animals. The Halakha is different there, as the Merciful One has pity on them. Therefore, an animal is killed only if it enjoyed the transgression. Sanhedrin 55b. The Gemara suggests, Come and hear a resolution from the Mishnah to the dilemma concerning an animal with which a Gentile committed bestiality. Alternatively, it is so that this animal will not pass through the marketplace, and those who see it will say, This is the animal because of which so-and-so was stoned, and its existence would shame his memory. What, is it not evident from the fact that the latter clause of the Mishnah includes two reasons for the killing of the animal, namely both the calamity and the shame caused by the animal, that the first clause the first reason stated in the Mishnah, is referring to a case of a calamity without shame? And what are the circumstances of a calamity without shame? It is the case of a Gentile who engages in intercourse with an animal. In that case there is a calamity, as the Gentile is executed, but his shame is not the concern of the Jewish court. The Gemara rejects this proof, no? The latter clause is referring to a case of both a calamity and shame. But this first clause teaches us that even in a case where there is a circumstance of shame alone without the calamity of execution, the court is obligated to kill the animal. Although the Mishnah employs the term, calamity, it is possible that this is referring to the calamity of the transgression, not the execution of the transgressor. And what are the circumstances of this case? It is a case of a Jew who unwittingly engages in intercourse with an animal and this is just like the case about which Rav Hamnunah raises a dilemma. As Rav Hamnunah raises a dilemma, with regard to a Jew who unwittingly engages in intercourse with an animal, what is the halakha? Is the animal stoned to death? Do we need both a calamity and shame in order to put it to death, and therefore here the animal is not killed, as there is shame, but there is no calamity of execution, or perhaps shame is enough, even if there is no calamity? Rav Yosef says, Come and hear a resolution from a Mishnah, Nidda 44 be a girl who is three years and one day old whose father arranged her betrothal is betrothed with intercourse, as the legal status of intercourse with her is that of full-fledged intercourse. And in a case where the childless husband of a girl who is three years and one day old dies, if his brother, the Yavim, engages in intercourse with her, he acquires her as his wife and if she is married, a man other than her husband is liable for engaging in intercourse with her due to the prohibition of intercourse with a married woman. The Mishnah continues, and if she is impure due to menstruation, she transmits impurity to one who engages in intercourse with her, who then renders all the items designated for lying beneath him impure like the items designated for lying above him. If she marries a priest, she may partake of truma like any other wife of a priest. If she is unmarried and one of the men who are unfit for the priesthood, example, a mamzer or elo, engages in intercourse with her, he has disqualified her from marrying into the priesthood, and if she is the daughter of a priest, she is disqualified from partaking of truma. The Mishnah continues, and if one of any of those with whom relations are forbidden, who are stated in the Torah, engaged in intercourse with her, example, her father or father-in-law, they are executed by the court for engaging in intercourse with her, and she is exempt because she is a minor. The Gemara infers, one of any of those with whom relations are forbidden apparently includes even an animal. And here, there is shame but there is no calamity, as she is not executed due to her status as a minor, and yet the Mishnah teaches, they are executed for engaging in intercourse with her. Evidently, the animal is killed. The Gemara rejects this proof 
since she committed this transgression intentionally, there is a calamity as well, and it is the merciful one who has pity on her due to her young age, and exempts her from punishment. And although the merciful one has pity on her, he does not have pity on the animal. Therefore, it cannot be proven from here that shame without a calamity is sufficient cause for the animal to be put to death, because calamity is present in this case. Rava says, Come and hear a proof from the subsequent Mishnah, Nida 45a with regard to a boy who was nine years and one day old, whose brother died childless, and who engaged in intercourse with his Yavama, his brother's widow, the status of the intercourse is that of full-fledged intercourse and he has acquired her as his wife. But if he chooses to end the marriage, he cannot give her a bill of divorce until he reaches majority. And he becomes richly impure like a menstruating woman after engaging in intercourse with her, and then renders all the items designated for lying beneath him impure like the items designated for lying above him. The Mishnah continues, if he is disqualified from the priesthood and engages in intercourse with the daughter of a priest, he disqualifies her from partaking of truma. But if he is a priest who marries an Israelite woman, he does not enable her to partake of truma. And if he engages in intercourse with an animal, he disqualifies the animal from being sacrificed upon the altar, and the animal is stoned on the basis of intercourse with him. And if he engaged in intercourse with one of any of those with whom relations are forbidden, who are stated in the Torah, they are executed by the court on the basis of intercourse with him, but he is exempt. The Gemara infers, and here, in a case where he engages in intercourse with an animal, there is shame, but there is no calamity, and yet the Mishnah teaches that the animal is stoned on the basis of intercourse with him, indicating that shame is sufficient for the animal to be killed. The Gemara rejects this proof, since he committed this transgression intentionally, there is a calamity as well and it is the merciful one who has pity on him due to his minority. Although the merciful one has pity on him, the merciful one does not have pity on the animal. Therefore, it cannot be proven from here that shame without a calamity is sufficient cause for the animal to be put to death, because calamity is present in this case. The Gemara suggests, Come and hear a resolution from the Mishnah, 54a Alternatively, it is so that this animal will not pass through the marketplace and those who see it will say, This is the animal because of which so and so was stoned. What, is it not evident from the fact that the latter clause of the Mishnah includes two reasons for the killing of the animal, namely both the calamity and the shame caused by the animal, that the first clause, the first reason stated in the Mishnah, is referring to a case of shame without a calamity? And what are the circumstances of shame without a calamity? It is the case of a Jew who unwittingly engages in intercourse with an animal. The Gemara rejects this proof. No, perhaps the latter clause is referring to a case where there is both a calamity and shame, while the first clause is referring to a case where there is a calamity without shame. And what are the circumstances of a calamity without shame? It is the case of a Gentile who engages in intercourse with an animal, as the students asked Rav Sheshit. The dilemma is left unresolved. No conclusive answer can be inferred from the Mishnah for either this dilemma or for the dilemma raised by the students of Rav Sheshit, Sanhedrin 69a. And the merciful one states, But if the man has no relative, teaching that it is only in the case of a convert who is a man that you must go around seeking whether or not he has relatives, i.e., children who were born to him after his conversion. But in the case of a convert who is a minor, you do not have to go around searching for relatives it is known that he has no relative, since a minor cannot father a child. Abe raised an objection to Rabbah from a Baraita discussing a designated maidservant, about whom the verse states, And if a man lies carnally with a woman who is a maidservant designated to a man, and not fully redeemed, nor freedom given her, inquiry shall be made, they shall not be put to death, because she was not free. Leviticus 19 verse 20 From the word, man, I have derived only that this halakha applies to an adult man. But as for a minor aged nine years and one day, who is fit for engaging in intercourse, from where is it derived that he too is subject to this halakha? The verse states, And if a man. The extraneous letter vav, meaning and, serves to include a minor who is nine years old, as already at that age he can perform complete intercourse. Rabbah said to obey, There is no proof from here as even though a nine-year-old boy has sperm, he cannot father a child. 
His sperm is like the seed of grain that was cut even though it had not yet reached one-third of its growth. Such seed, even if planted, will not grow. A sage of the school of Izkia taught, the verse states, But if a man comes intentionally, Yazid, against his neighbor, to slay him with guile, you shall take him from my altar, that he may die. Exodus 21 verse 14. The use of the term Yazid in this context, and its juxtaposition to the word, man, teaches that a man can heat, mezid, himself up and produce viable sperm, but a minor cannot heat himself up and produce viable sperm. Therefore, even though a minor can engage in full intercourse with a woman, he cannot father a child. Rav Mordecai said to Rav Ashi, From where may it be inferred that this word mezid is a term meaning heating up? As it is written in a different verse, And Jacob cooked, viazed, pottage, Genesis 25 verse 29. The Gemara asks, But didn't the school of Rabbi Yishmael teach the following Baraita concerning a stubborn and rebellious son? The verse that states, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, teaches that a son can become a stubborn and rebellious son, but not a father, so that one who has a child cannot be sentenced as a stubborn and rebellious son. The Gemara asks, What are the circumstances? If we say that his wife conceived after he grew two pubic hairs and the baby was born before he grew a beard around his genitals, is there such a long interval between these two times to allow for carrying the child to term? But doesn't Rabbi Kruspadai say, the entire time during which it is possible to judge and sentence a stubborn and rebellious son is only three months, the time between the appearance of two pubic hairs and the growth of a beard around the genitals? Consequently, it is impossible for a child to be born to the stubborn and rebellious son during this period. Rather, is it not that his wife conceived before he grew two pubic hairs, and the baby was born before he grew a beard around his genitals? And you can learn from it that a minor can, in fact, father a child. The Gemara rejects this reasoning. No, actually, you can explain that his wife conceived only after he grew two pubic hairs and the baby was born after he grew a beard around his genitals. And as for that which is difficult for you based on the statement of Rabbi Kruspadai that the halakha governing a stubborn and rebellious son applies for only three months, it can be explained as follows. When Rav Dimi came from Eretz Yisrael to Babylonia, he said that they say in the West, Eretz Yisrael, that the term, son, teaches that only a son can become a stubborn and rebellious son, but not one who is fit to be called a father. That is to say, the verse does not exclude someone whose child was born during this period, but rather one whose wife conceived during this time, so that he is fit to be called a father. Returning to the matter itself, Rabbi Kruspadai says that Rabbi Shabtai says, the entire time during which it is possible to judge and sentence a stubborn and rebellious son is only three months. The Gemara asks, but didn't we learn in the Mishnah that a boy can be judged as a stubborn and rebellious son from when he grows two pubic hairs until he grows a beard around his genitals? This seems to indicate that his liability depends on his physical maturity, and not on any specific time period. The Gemara answers, If he grew a beard around his genitals, then even if three months have not passed, he can no longer become liable as a stubborn and rebellious son. And if three months passed, then even if he has not grown a beard around his genitals, he is similarly exempt. Rabbi Yaakov from Nihar Pikad sat before Ravina and sat and said in the name of Rav Huna, son of Rav Yehoshua, Learn from the statement that Rabbi Kruspadai says that Rabbi Shabtai says that when a woman gives birth at seven months, her fetus cannot yet be discerned after one-third of her days of pregnancy. In a nine-month pregnancy, the fetus can be discerned after three months which is one-third of the pregnancy. In the case of a pregnancy that lasts seven months, the fetus cannot be discerned at the end of one-third of the pregnancy, i.e., after two and one-third months, but after three months, as in a standard nine-month pregnancy. Rabbi Yaakov explains the inference, as if it enters your mind that when a woman gives birth at seven months, her fetus can already be discerned after one-third of her days of pregnancy, i.e., after two and one-third months, why do I need three months from the time the boy reaches adulthood until the end of the time that he can become liable as a stubborn and rebellious son? A period of two and one-third months should suffice. If he engaged in intercourse with a woman immediately upon reaching adulthood and the intercourse resulted in a seven-month pregnancy, the fetus would be able to be discerned after two and one-third months, and he would be fit to be called a father. 
already from then. From the statement of Rabbi Kruspadai, citing Rabbi Shabtai, it is clear that the earliest time the fetus can be discerned is after three months of the pregnancy have passed. Ravena said to Rabbi Yaakov, Actually, I could say to you that even when a woman gives birth at seven months, her fetus can already be discerned after one-third of her days of pregnancy. But the halakha with regard to a stubborn and rebellious son was not adjusted accordingly because of the principle that one follows the majority. Most women give birth at nine months, and their fetuses are discernible only after three months. Therefore, the fact that one would be fit to be called a father in the case of a seven-month pregnancy is disregarded. The sages stated this answer before Rav Huna, son of Rav Yehoshua, whereupon he said to them, But do we blindly follow the majority in cases of capital law and not judge each case on its own merits? Doesn't the Torah state, And the congregation shall judge, and the congregation shall deliver, Numbers 35 colon 24, 25, from which it is derived that the court must make every effort to find exculpatory arguments in support of the accused, and yet you say that one follows the majority? If it is possible that already after two and one-third months the stubborn and rebellious son will be fit to be called a father, from that time on he should be exempt from punishment. The sages then brought Rav Huna's analysis back to Ravina and presented it before him. Ravina said to them, and do we not follow the majority in cases of capital law? But didn't we learn in the Mishnah, Sanhedrin 40a if one witness says that the event occurred on the second of the month, and one witness says that the event occurred on the third of the month, this is not regarded as a contradiction and their testimony stands since it is possible to say that this witness knows of the addition of a day to the previous month, and according to his tally the event occurred on the second of the month and that witness does not know of the addition of a day to the previous month, and according to his tally the event occurred on the third of the month. And if it enters your mind that we do not say that one follows the majority in cases of capital law, let us then say that these witnesses are testifying with precision, and that they contradict each other, and therefore the accused should be acquitted. Rather, is it not because we say that one follows the majority? and the majority of people are apt to err with regard to the addition of an extra day to the month? Rabbi Yermia of Difti says, We learn in another Mishnah, Nidda 44b, as well that one follows the majority even in cases of capital law, a girl who is three years and one day old whose father arranged her betrothal can be betrothed with intercourse, as, despite her age, the legal status of intercourse with her is that of full-fledged intercourse and in a case where the childless husband of a girl three years and one day old dies, if his brother, the Yavam, engages in intercourse with her, he acquires her as his wife. And if a girl of that age is married, a man other than her husband is liable for engaging in intercourse with her due to violation of the prohibition against adultery, as despite her age she is legally considered to be a married woman. The Mishnah continues, and if she is impure due to menstruation, she transmits impurity to one who engages in intercourse with her, who then renders all the items designated for lying beneath him impure like the items designated for lying above him. If she marries a priest, she may partake of truma like any other wife of a priest. If she is unmarried and one of the men who is unfit for the priesthood, example, a mamzer or elo, engaged in intercourse with her, he has disqualified her from marrying into the priesthood, and if she is the daughter of a priest, she is disqualified from partaking of truma. And if one of any of those with whom relations are forbidden, which are enumerated in the Torah, engaged in intercourse with her, example, her father or father-in-law, the man is executed by the court for engaging in intercourse with her, and she is exempt because she is a minor. Sanhedrin 69b. Rabbi Yermia of Difti explains how this Mishnah demonstrates that one follows the majority even in cases of capital law. Why is a man who engaged in intercourse with a three-year-old girl who was married to another man liable to receive the death penalty? Say that perhaps it will turn out that she is a sexually underdeveloped woman, alienate, who is incapable of bearing children, and her husband did not betroth her with this understanding, and consequently the marriage is null, as it was entered into in error. Therefore, a man who engaged in intercourse with her should not be liable to receive the death penalty for adultery. Rather, is it not that we say that one follows the majority, and the majority of women are not sexually underdeveloped women, and therefore the assumption is that the betrothal was valid? 
This is proof that even in cases of capital law one follows the majority. The Gemara refutes this claim, no, rather, what is the meaning of that which is taught in the Mishnah, and if she is married, a man other than her husband is liable for engaging in intercourse with her due to violation of the prohibition against intercourse with a married woman? This means that if a man unwittingly engaged in intercourse with a three-year-old girl who was married to another man, he is liable to bring a sin offering, but there is no liability to receive the death penalty based on a majority. The Gemara asks, But wasn't it taught in the Mishnah, and if one of any of those with whom relations are forbidden, which are enumerated in the Torah, engaged in intercourse with her, the man is executed by the court for engaging in intercourse with her? The Gemara answers, this is referring to a case where her father or some other close relative engaged in intercourse with her, so that the prohibition is incest, rather than adultery. The Gemara asks, But wasn't it taught, if one of any of those with whom relations are forbidden engaged in intercourse with her, the man is executed by the court for engaging in intercourse with her? This seems to indicate that the death penalty is imposed for all types of forbidden intercourse with a three-year-old girl even if the intercourse is forbidden as a result of her being married. The Gemara refutes this claim, rather, what are we dealing with here? With a case where the husband explicitly accepted her upon himself as his wife even if she turns out to be a sexually undeveloped woman. Therefore, another man who engages in intercourse with her is liable to receive the death penalty even if he is not one of her close relatives. The sage is taught in a Baraita, if a woman was acting lewdly with her minor son, and he performed the initial stage of intercourse with her, by Shammai say that he has thereby disqualified her from marrying into the priesthood. And by Hillel deem her fit to marry into the priesthood, because they maintain that the intercourse of a minor is not regarded as intercourse. Rabbi Aya, son of Rabbi Barnamani, says that Ravista says, and some say that Ravista says that Zayari says, all, i.e., both by Shammai and by Hillel concede with regard to a boy nine years and one day old that his intercourse is regarded as intercourse and disqualifies a woman from marrying into the priesthood as well as results in her liability to receive the death penalty, even though he himself is not liable to receive it. And they also all concede concerning a boy less than eight years old that his intercourse is not regarded as intercourse vis a vis these halakot. They disagree only about a boy who is eight years old as Bait Shammai maintain that we learn from earlier generations, when people were able to father children at that age, and we apply that reality to the present, and Bait Hillel maintain that we do not learn from earlier generations. The Gemara asks, and from where do we derive that in earlier generations men fathered children at this age? If we say that we know this from the following calculation, it is written, Is this not Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah the Hittite? 2 Samuel 11 verse 3. And it is also written, And Eliam, son of Ahithophel the Jilonite, 2 Samuel 23 verse 34, which teaches that Bathsheba was the granddaughter of Ahithophel. And it is written with reference to the birth of Solomon, and he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah, for the Lord's sake, 2 Samuel 12 verse 25. And later it is written, And it came to pass after two years, that Absalom had sheep shearers, 2 Samuel 13 verse 23, and at that time Amnon was killed, see 2 Samuel 13 verses 23 to 29, this being at least two years after Solomon was born. And afterward it is written, So Absalom fled, and went to Geshur, and was there three years, 2 Samuel 13 verse 38, so that this was five years after Solomon was born. And it is written, So Absalom dwelt two years in Jerusalem and did not see the king's face, 2 Samuel 14 verse 28, bringing the tally to seven years after Solomon was born. And it is written, And it came to pass after forty years, that Absalom said to the king, I pray you, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord, in Hebron. 2 Samuel 15 verse 7. This was the beginning of Absalom's rebellion against David. Accordingly, at that time Solomon was at least seven years old and at some point during the rebellion it is written, And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey, and arose, and went to his house, to his city, and put his household in order, and strangled himself and died. 2 Samuel 17 verse 23 And it is written, 
bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. Psalms 55 verse 24. And in keeping with this verse, it is taught in a Berida, all of Dog's years were only thirty-four and Ahithophel's were only thirty-three. Neither reached the age of thirty-five, half of the normal life span of seventy years. Based on this, one can calculate, how many years did Ahithophel live? Thirty-three. Subtract seven years, Solomon's age at the time of Ahithophel's death which leaves Ahithophel twenty-six years old at the time of Solomon's birth. Subtract two more years for three pregnancies, one preceding the birth of Eliam the son of Ahithophel, one preceding the birth of Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and one preceding the birth of Solomon, son of Bathsheba. It turns out that three generations were born in twenty-four years, and that each and every parent begot a child at the age of eight. The Gemara refutes this proof. From where do you prove this? Perhaps both Ahithophel and his son Eliam fathered children when they were each nine years old, and Bathsheba gave birth to Solomon when she was six, because a woman is stronger and can conceive at an earlier age. Know that this is true that women conceive at an earlier age, as Bathsheba had already given birth to a child from David before giving birth to Solomon. See 2 Samuel 11 verse 27. Therefore, no proof can be derived from here. Rather, it is from here that one can deduce that in earlier generations men fathered children at the age of eight, as it is written. And these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahar, and Haran. Genesis 11 verse 27. And Abraham was at least one year older than Nahar, and Nahar was one year older than Haran, so it turns out that Abraham was two years older than Haran. And it is written, And Abram and Nahar took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahar's wife was Milcah, daughter of Haran, father of Milcah and father of Iscah. Genesis 11 verse 29. And Rabbi Yitzhak says, Iscah is in fact Sarah. And why was she called Iscah? Because she envisioned Shisoka, hidden matters by means of divine inspiration. And this explains what is written. In all that Sarah has said to you, hearken to her voice. Genesis 21 verse 12. Alternatively, Sarah was also called Iska, because all gazed sock him upon her beauty. And it is written, And Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, give birth? Genesis 17 verse 17 How much older was Abraham than Sarah? He was ten years older than her and... As stated above, he was two years older than her father, Haran. It turns out then that when Haran begot Sarah, he begot her at the age of eight. The Gemara refutes this proof. From where do you prove this? Perhaps Abraham was the youngest of the brothers, and not the oldest among them. The fact that Abraham is listed first is no proof that he was the oldest, as perhaps the verse listed them in the order of their wisdom, and therefore Abraham, being the wisest, was mentioned first. Know that it is true that the verse sometimes lists brothers not according to their birth order, but in the order of their degrees of wisdom, as it is written. And Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 5 verse 32. According to this, Shem was at least one year older than Ham, and Ham one year older than Japheth, so it turns out that Shem was two years older than Japheth. And it is written, and Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Genesis 7 verse 6 And it is written, These are the descendants of Shem. Shem was one hundred years old, and begot our pet Shad two years after the flood. Genesis 11 verse 10 If Shem was the oldest brother, how could he be only one hundred years old? He must have been at least one hundred and two years old, as Noah was five hundred years old when his third son was born and he was six hundred years old at the time of the flood. Rather, the verse listed them in the order of their degrees of wisdom, Shem being the wisest. With regard to his age, Shem was the youngest of the brothers, having been born when Noah was five hundred and two years old. Shem begot his son one hundred years later, which was two years after the flood. Here too, then, with regard to the sons of Terah, it can be argued that the verse lists them in the order of their degrees of wisdom. Rav Kahana says, I stated this discussion before Rav Zevid of Neharde. When he heard it, he said to me, 
you learn that Shem was not Noah's oldest son from there, and we learn it from here. And to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, to him also were children born. Genesis 10 verse 21. This verse indicates that Japheth, rather than Shem, was the oldest of the brothers. The Gemara asks, rather, from where do we derive that in earlier generations men fathered children at the age of eight? From here, as it is written, And Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. Exodus 38 verse 22. And it is written, And Azubah died, and Caleb took for himself Ephrat, who bore him her. And her begot Uri, and Uri begot Bezalel. First Chronicles 2 verses 19 to 20. And when Bezalel made the tabernacle how old was he? He must have been at least thirteen years old, and it is written, Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. Psalms 55 verse 24. And in keeping with this verse, it is taught in a Baraita, all of Dog's years were only thirty-four and Ahithophel's were only thirty-three. Neither reached the age of thirty-five, half of the normal life span of seventy years. Based on this, one can calculate, how many years did Ahithophel live? Thirty-three. Subtract seven years, Solomon's age at the time of Ahithophel's death, which leaves Ahithophel twenty-six years old at the time of Solomon's birth. Subtract two more years for three pregnancies, one preceding the birth of Eliam the son of Ahithophel, one preceding the birth of Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and one preceding the birth of Solomon, son of Bathsheba. It turns out that three generations were born in twenty-four years, and that each and every parent begot a child at the age of eight. The Gemara refutes this proof. From where do you prove this? Perhaps both Ahithophel and his son Eliam fathered children when they were each nine years old, and Bathsheba gave birth to Solomon when she was six, because a woman is stronger and can conceive at an earlier age. Know that this is true that women conceive at an earlier age, as Bathsheba had already given birth to a child from David before giving birth to Solomon. See 2 Samuel 11 verse 27. Therefore, no proof can be derived from here. Rather, it is from here that one can deduce that in earlier generations men fathered children at the age of eight, as it is written. And these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahar, and Haran. Genesis 11 verse 27. And Abraham was at least one year older than Nahar, and Nahar was one year older than Haran, so it turns out that Abraham was two years older than Haran. And it is written, And Abram and Nahar took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahar's wife was Milcah, daughter of Haran, father of Milcah and father of Iscah. Genesis 11 verse 29. And Rabbi Yitzhak says, Iscah is in fact Sarah. And why was she called Iscah? Because she envisioned Shisoka, hidden matters by means of divine inspiration. And this explains what is written. In all that Sarah has said to you, hearken to her voice. Genesis 21 verse 12. Alternatively, Sarah was also called Iska, because all gazed sock him upon her beauty. And it is written, And Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, give birth? Genesis 17 verse 17 How much older was Abraham than Sarah? He was ten years older than her and as stated above, he was two years older than her father, Haran. It turns out then that when Haran begot Sarah, he begot her at the age of eight. The Gemara refutes this proof. From where do you prove this? Perhaps Abraham was the youngest of the brothers, and not the oldest among them. The fact that Abraham is listed first is no proof that he was the oldest, as perhaps the verse listed them in the order of their wisdom, and therefore Abraham, being the wisest, was mentioned first. Know that it is true that the verse sometimes lists brothers not according to their birth order, but in the order of their degrees of wisdom, as it is written. And Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 5 verse 32. According to this, Shem was at least one year older than Ham, and Ham one year older than Japheth, so it turns out that Shem was two years older than Japheth. And it is written, and Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Genesis 7 verse 6 
And it is written, These are the descendants of Shem. Shem was one hundred years old, and begot Arpachshad two years after the flood. Genesis 11 verse 10 If Shem was the oldest brother, how could he be only one hundred years old? He must have been at least one hundred and two years old, as Noah was five hundred years old when his third son was born, and he was six hundred years old at the time of the flood. Rather, the verse listed them in the order of their degrees of wisdom, Shem being the wisest. With regard to his age, Shem was the youngest of the brothers, having been born when Noah was five hundred and two years old. Shem begot his son one hundred years later, which was two years after the flood. Here too, then, with regard to the sons of Terah, it can be argued that the verse lists them in the order of their degrees of wisdom. Rav Kahana says, I stated this discussion before Rav Zevit of Neharde. When he heard it, he said to me, You learn that Shem was not Noah's oldest son from there, and we learn it from here. And to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, to him also were children born. Genesis 10 verse 21. This verse indicates that Japheth, rather than Shem, was the oldest of the brothers. The Gemara asks, Rather, from where do we derive that in earlier generations men fathered children at the age of eight? From here, as it is written, And Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord commanded Moses. Exodus 38 verse 22 And it is written, And Azubah died, and Caleb took for himself Ephrat, who bore him her. And her begot Uri, and Uri begot Bezalel. 1 Chronicles 2 verses 19 to 20. And when Bezalel made the tabernacle how old was he? He must have been at least thirteen years old, as it is written. And all the wise men that carried out all the work of the sanctuary, came every man from his work that they did. Exodus 36 verse 4, And one who is less than thirteen is not called a man, and it is taught in a Baraita. In the first year following the exodus from Egypt Moses made the tabernacle. In the second year he erected the tabernacle and sent, and it is written that Caleb, Bezalel's great-grandfather, said to Joshua, I was forty years old when Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. Joshua 14 verse 7. And he added, And now, behold, I am this day eighty-five years old. Joshua 14 verse 10. How many years old was Caleb when he was sent off with the spies? He was forty. Subtract fourteen years, as Bezalel was at least fourteen years old when Caleb was sent to spy out the land. This is known because that mission took place a year after the tabernacle was erected. This leaves twenty-six years. Subtract two more years for three pregnancies, one preceding the birth of her, son of Caleb, one preceding the birth of Uri, son of her, and one preceding the birth of Bezalel, son of Uri. It turns out that three generations were born in twenty-four years, and that each and every parent begot a child at the age of eight. The Mishnah teaches that the penalty for rebelliousness is imposed upon a son, but not upon a daughter. It is taught in a Baraita. Rabbi Shimon says, It would be reasonable that a daughter should be fit to be treated like a stubborn and rebellious son, and to be punished like him if she sins in the same way as he does.